It's a new week. Good morning and welcome to Business Morning on Channel Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. I'm Daddy Morgan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's take a look at what's in the news. Uh, oil prices fell nearly 2% today, extending uh, last week's uh, steep losses on the back of a rising U.S. dollar and concerns that a new pandemic curves in Asia, especially China, uh, may set back the global recovery in fuel demand. The curves include uh, flight cancellations, Warnings by 46 cities against traveling, uh, limits on public transport and taxi services in 144 of the worst hit areas. Brent crude futures are slid by $1.27 to $69.43 a barrel after having a slump 6% last week. That's the biggest uh, weekly loss in four months. U.S. Texas, uh, West Texas intermediate crude futures uh, fell $1.29 to $66.99 a barrel after having slumped down nearly 7% last week, the steepest weekly decline in nine months. Monday, China reported 125 new COVID-19 cases, up from 96 a day earlier. Malaysia and Thailand uh, infections continue to hit daily records of more than 20,000. Well, back here in Nigeria, the country's foreign exchange reserve closed higher for the third consecutive week in the week ended 7th of August, 2021 after its gross position increased by $137.23 million week on week to $33.54 billion as at the 4th of August. The sustained increase in the country's external buffer, which is largely attributed to inflow of foreign currency from crude oil sales this week, comes after the International Monetary Fund allocated about $3.35 billion to Nigeria as part of historic general allocation of special drawing rights to the country. According to the IMF, the general allocation of SDRs will become effective on the 23rd of this month, and the newly created SDRs will be credited to IMF member countries in proportion to their existing quotas in the fund. Special drawing rights is an international reserve asset created by the IMF to supplement the official reserves of its member countries. And now to, to some big announcement. The chairman of Xenox Group, Mr. Leo Stanek, has been honored with the highly coveted Forbes Best Africa Leading Tech Icon Award. This marks the latest in a long list of credible local and international awards and recognitions received by Mr. AK for his over three decades of leadership and pioneering entrepreneurship in the information and communications technology space in Africa, as well as his uh, many enduring philanthropic and uh, humanitarian legacies. He has been singled out for funding the most integrated ICT group in Africa, with influence in four continents, as well as uh, for pioneering e-commerce, desktop publishing and computer graphics, wireless cloud, and uh, WiMAX. First locally assembled and internationally certified computer brand, Xenox, uh, digital dispensing pumps for fuel and gas stations, as well as uh, biometric revolution for elections on the continent. And uh, foreign direct investment is critical to improving the economic health of the African continent. The chairman of Foreign Investment Network, Mrs. Alain Kafayemi, made this known at a virtual roundtable on leadership and philanthropy in Africa. Well, speaking at that event was also the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, who was representing the Vice President, and he highlighted the importance of stakeholder cap capitalism. Let's listen to him. The world is changing. Profit is no longer the only bottom line. Areas like sustainability, a business's effect on the environment, and most importantly, the effect on the lives of the people that live and work in that environment are just as fundamental. There is a new term that I have been hearing a lot recently, stakeholder capitalism. The principle behind it is that business leaders now need to define their mission as creating long-term value for not just themselves or their shareholders, but for all stakeholders. This includes their employees, their suppliers, the communities they do business in, and the people that interact with their brand. What does this mean in modern Africa? It means that companies must be more intentional about all aspects of their business strategy. Would your organization source for more of its inputs and materials locally, or go a step further and purchase directly from perhaps smallholder farmers or local MSMEs? Could working conditions be improved to increase staff retention or CEO worker pay ratio be reduced to create opportunities for wage increases and camaraderie. We are moving into a world where stakeholder capitalism is no longer a nice to have, but a prerequisite. 
Well, in April, the World Bank released a report that businesses in Nigeria lose about $229 billion annually as a result of the country's unreliable electricity. It's also observed that Nigeria had the largest number of people without access to electricity in the world, as everyone in 10 people have without access to electricity. Now, this has birthed an opportunity to better serve these communities through mini-grids, which use existing distribution and incorporate distributed energy sources. Mini-grid, which is an off-grid electricity distribution network, involves small-scale electricity generation, and it seems to be gaining popularity in Nigeria. Last month, an institute in collaboration with Abaddon Electricity Distribution Company started the country's first commercial on-the-grid mini-grid in a rural community cross boundaries, also in a similar line. And that's why we have with us now Nina Afani Itemwagbo, the Senior Manager, Customer Experience, Power Gen Renewable Energy, to tell us about what they are Great doing with mini grids in Nigeria. Good to have you, Nina. Good morning. Same morning. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so tell us, let's start with what are mini grids? You just already said that when you in your introduction. Um, Let's hear from the pro. All yeah. right. Um, just a simple, basic um, explanation of what mini grids are. Like you rightfully said, mini grids are off-grid electricity distribution network involving small-scale electricity generation. Plain simple. Well, how how does it work, really? How does it work? Okay. So you have components that um, are used in the mini grid sector. Um, basically, which is a scaled down version of what you have with the larger discos. Um, you have the key major components are your solar PV panels, you have your batteries, you have your storage banks, you have your inverters, and of course, you would have maybe like a backup generator that for the period when the solar peak isn't at its highest peak. Mm. So basically, there are components which come together, which you would definitely deploy in. Um, a location or community that are either underserved or, you know, or totally off-grid and um, be able to power up the communities using solar generated from the sun. Okay, right. so uh, um, we know that some states have attempted to produce power. Yes. But there are some legal hurdles yes. that limits, you know, the and amount of that. power that can be produced. And these are states, these are governments. For you as a private entity delving into supply of power, right. what legal uh, huddles or what legal freedom do you have yeah. and how much can you produce? Okay, so um, it actually varies, right? Um, you can actually do between um, lower kilowatts to, you know, up to one megawatt for a mini grid. Um, however, there are regulations guiding how we operate um, and kudos to the REA and of course um, the power ministry as well as other, you know, credible organizations that partner with them to enable, create an enable environment for uh, PowerGen that I work for, as well as other mini developers that are in the sector. Um, so basically what they, what we do, you know, how, it's, it, how is it possible for them to be able to do this? It's easy because one of the key things is the regulations and policies that guides, you know, our operations, which has been made very, very transparent. There's a lot of um, stakeholder um, engagement, uh, both on the part of the government, both on the part of REA, which is more or less like a, a guiding um, um, agency that oversees what we do, as well as other organizations that partner to provide funding and grants for, to enable us to be able to carry out this. So regulation is one of the key things. Policy driving this is something that the administration, the current administration, you know, has been driving essentially and which has obviously helped you know drive the the work that we're currently doing right. across different states within the country all right so talking about you know an enabling environment yeah. the rural electrification agency has promised to you know create yes. an enabling environment can you give us a picture on uh, what it's like presently okay all right, um, so just a little bit of a sneak peek into how this has, you know, worked out across board. Um, so for, for us in the as private sector, in uh, developers in coming into the power sector to try and, you know, fill in the gap, you know, the existing gap that we have and be able to create um, um, and provide power to last mile communities that don't have. So one of the good things that the REA has been able to achieve is, you know, um, ensuring that, you know, the uh, enable environment in terms of regulations, the regulations that would guide how this is operated, how this is managed, as well as also um, looking at possible ways of, you know, supporting developers in this space to be able to um, uh, create an environment whereby we get some form of 
rebate or subsidies, you know, um, from the government uh, as regards to how we, you know, import the components that we require um, and bring them into the country, um, as well as tax waivers that would also help us to be able to, you know, do more and be able to reach more communities that are, you know, totally off grid. So that's one of the key things that's been very um, helpful in doing, as well as, you know, we have World Bank as well as the AFDB which has also come in to, to play to also provide funding for some of the key things that we need to be able to drive, you know, the achievements that we're currently seeing. So, so is your major target the off-grid or the rural area, or is it just anywhere? And how accessible are you to an average Nigerian? Great question, Ini. Um, to answer your question this way, right? Now, mini grids can be used in off grid, totally off grid or underserved communities. Now, totally off grid, we have communities that are not going to be powered by the discos. It's not in their five year or 10 year rollout plan, right, for the discos. So, in such areas, we come in and we, you know, we look at the gaps that are there and we try and fill in that gaps by providing power to such communities. However, we also have another component which speaks to the interconnected mini grids, whereby we, you know, complement and collaborate with the discos to um, power up such communities that are underserved and have, you know, commercial and industrial um, uh, industries within such communities. So you have the interconnected mini grids that speaks to such larger communities, or urban, semi-urban, or peri-urban communities, as well as the off grids as well. All right, so, um, you know, presently the world is moving towards, um, you know, electric vehicles right. and uh, EVs. But, um, you know, looking at Nigeria at some point would yes. have to catch up. Definitely. What role would the uh, mini grids actually play, you know, when it comes to electric vehicles? Oh, that's interesting. No, clean energy. Clean, clean energy, energy yeah. right. Right, that's an interesting question, Ladi. Um, so, with the mini grid sector, one of the good things, I'll have you know that, you know, speaking to that already, we're already, you know, going into that area, already exploring that. I'll let you know that, okay, that in the mini grid sector, there are some things that have been done in other parts of Africa. We're trying to introduce that into Nigeria, where we have something called e-mobility. What that is looking at is having um, electric bikes. So in the rural communities, we realize that the major mode of transportation is either the, bike, the motorbikes, which is largely used in such communities. So in trying to experiment with this, we're trying to also work with other you know, organizations whereby we bring in electric mo motorbikes, which would be very, very key for such um, rural areas because that's their main, main mode. They, they can't afford the, the typical cars that you have here. Mm -hmm. So in us, on the developer side, PowerGen and other um, developers, what we're trying to do is to look at ways by which we can create a market for such um, communities whereby you know, we bring in electric bikes and have like a charging station Right, so which will be, of course, running on solar as well, and all they need to do is just pay a token for using that charging station so to power value, their bike. That's a value chain. Value right chain, there. you know. So bringing in the bikes is one, then also providing a charging point for them as one. And you know, with this, with the success of this, we would now obviously, you know, take it to a larger level, whereby you know, the electric cars coming in, we also have that, you know, avail available for them in urban areas as well. Okay. So now let's talk about financing because. Yes, please. Uh, at this time, when a, a larger population depend on the grid, uh, the discos are in the picture, and they complain that the tariffs are not cost effective, which yes. is why uh, many times they cannot replace equipment and you know re do restructure and the things that we need to have constant power. Thank God for the idea of the mini grid, but in order to know that it is sustainable, we have to talk about how how effective is the costing or the tariff connected to this. So especially since your first target will be the, you know, the off-grid and the rural areas, we know that the supply liquidity there is not very large, you know. Mm -hmm. So what is the system there to ensure that the tariff is sustainable and for you to be able to capture and still be able to supply, you know, the power that is needed? Mm -hmm. All right, that's an interesting question, Nini. Thanks once again. Um, okay, so for the mini grid sector, right? Um, yes, we know that there are tenant issues in the discos till date, and that uh, there are complaints even from you know uh, regular users in the discos about the tariff, and um, not having clarity on you know how much they're being built for you know power consumed. However, um, on the mini grid side, thanks to the area once again, and of course we have the NERC 
um, which largely regulates um, tariffs, um, how the mini grid sector, you know, implements its tariff across board in communities that we currently serve. Um, and in doing this, you know, we have the um, uh, the MITRE tool, which is used in calculating the tariffs that we obviously, you know, uh, uh, charge to the, the end mile user, the last mile user. Now, in doing that, you know, we also take into cognizance, you know, certain components um, with the NERC um, in be able to determine the appropriate tariff that we think is um, what the rural community member can afford to pay. And in also doing that, there are certain things that we on the developer side also do. We take into cognizance to try as much as possible to, you know, um, take cognizance of the fact that these communities that we are currently serving do not have the economic might to pay for, you know, a high tariff. So what we also do is try to bring in certain components to aid and you know soften the cushion the effect of it to them by giving them you know something like um, appliance financing that's an option that's available for them to to take up um, as well as also we also bring in um, equipments um, at a lower cost for them so we also do um, demand stimulation to try and you know stimulate demand within these communities by providing them with appropriate um, equipments that they need um, to to also ensure that they're able to consume power. We also educate them on the need for power and what the difference is between solar power and what you typically you know know has a disco and why there's a difference in the costing of course the only difference you know the large difference what is costing the difference in things is the fact that you know we still has a date still need you know government support in terms of subsidizing you know equipments that are brought in and over time you know with newer technologies coming in we have to see that you know there might be uh, you know potentially an avenue for us to reduce tariff you know further within the mini grid space you know but that's not to say it's going to be comparatively with what the discourse currently charge. However, you know, these are some of the things that we still continue to work, you know, closely with the REA and uh, continue to review um, the regulations guiding that. And um, if with, with time, I think, you know, things will obviously be at a better uh, okay. position for the Is your source of power just solar? So, yes. Solar is the uh, basic thing that, you know, we currently do in Nigeria. But there are other um, types of um, mini grids. You know, you have the wind mini grid, you have turbine, you know, so there are different types, you know. So, but essentially because in Nigeria, from, you know, where we are, where we sit, you know, we have a lot of sun here. We don't have, you know, if you were to go into um, wind or, you know, you probably need somewhere, somewhere close, like the coastal areas like Lagos, right. you know, that would be beneficial. But of course, that also needs you to have um, some amount of data, like over a year's data of wind and, you know, uh, stuff like that, that would enable us to be able to go into that. But that's also obtainable in other places in Africa that are closer to the coastal areas. Okay. Yeah. All right, John, uh, before we let you go now, uh, talk to us about uh, carbon credits and how Nigeria can actually, you know, profit from this? Hmm. <laughs> now that's speaking to emissions, right? Emissions, yes. To be honest and frank, um, I think this is something that, you know, the, the government um, through its agencies can seriously um, begin to work closely with um, other international organizations, looking into how we can essentially reduce, you know, our carbon emissions. And one of the key things, you know, which speaks for this administration is the fact that, you know, the support that we get on the developer side um, towards, you know, um, bringing renewable energy, that's one of the key things that would really drive, you know, um, a reduction in carbon emissions um, in Nigeria. And of course, you know, if there's enough concerted effort and, um, you know, government um, collaboration in ensuring that, you know, the, the renewable energy space, this is speaking over and beyond just the solar mini grids, right. you know, there are other avenues within renewable energy. Um, if there's a key focus on that and, you know, driving it with the right regulations, the right policies, you know, and putting, you know, value on the table, we would be able to achieve, you know, our carbon credits, you know, um, in the not too distant future. Okay. All right. Well, we don't see this clashing with uh, uh, the, the grid supply grid. because, yeah. I mean, yeah. for solar, it, even at this time, it's more expensive. Yes. So, and uh, the power is limited. So the number of gadgets or home devices that can be connected, are they, are they limited? Oh, no. Can you do the heavy things? Yes, with you this, can. Definitely. With the mini grid. So I would have you know that with the mini grid, right, 
you have the ability to power up everything and anything that you have in your house. The ACs, your fridge, freezer, your you know, sound system, anything at all, you can power that with a solar mini grid. Everything, I, I do have one, right, personally, and you know, it's, it's, it's cost efficient, and it saves you a lot of um, um, stress. Uh, you, of course, like the carbon emission, if you have and to put on a generation and, <laughs> and all that. Uh, of the exactly. <laughs> so it's, right. and we, we essentially just complement what the uh, discos are doing. It's there's no competition. competition. No competition. There's no competition. There's, still, there's, no. Still there's a lot the of parents. collaboration between us and the discos. So you're complimenting. <laughs> yes. All right. Essential. All right. Thank you so much, Thank Nina. You, Nina Afani Itemugwa is a senior manager, a customer experience at Pargen Renewable Energy, and uh, came to give us some highlights of mini grid. We'll take a break now. So After the much. break, we'll look at Stanbic IBTC asset, asset management and we're discussing infrastructure funds. Talking about infrastructure. That's after the break. Do stay with us. It's Business Morning on Channels Television. Welcome back. Uh, now to our next conversation. Stanbic IBTC Asset Management, a subsidiary of Stanbic IBTC Holdings PLC, uh, recently launched a 100 billionaire infrastructure fund uh, designed to institute for institutional investors such as pension uh, fund managers, uh, insurance companies, asset managers, and high net uh, worth individuals. It provides an opportunity for qualified investors to invest in uh, infrastructure projects such as transport, uh, logistics, power and uh, energy infrastructure, uh, telecoms, healthcare, uh, and, and others. Uh, the Stanbic IBTC Infrastructure Fund will focus on projects with the potential to deliver returns above a comparable benchmark of federal government of Nigeria bonds. Uh, the 100 billion naira infrastructure fund will provide alternative investment outlets for investors seeking uh, long-term sustainable investment opportunities and returns, and it will be uh, issued in tranches to finance long-term projects how will this uh, work? Uh, we have uh, Larry Mohammed now, Senior Vice President, Stambik IBTC uh, Infrastructure Fund. Joining us now in Business Morning. Great to have you. Good morning. Thank you very much. All right, so the, the Stambik IBTC Asset Management uh, recently you know, launched the 100 billion Naira Infrastructure Fund as an alternative outlet for institutional investors you know, seeking long-term sustainable investment opportunities and returns. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about this fund? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I think you've said it all. Um, we are launching this fund to provide opportunities to um, investors, particularly institutional investors, HNIs and the like, you know, to, to help us bridge the infrastructure gap that we have in Nigeria. So we are starting out with a 100 billion naira fund program, which is registered with the um, Securities and Exchange Commission as a closed-ended um, unit trust scheme. Um, essentially, what that does is it pulls together investors into this pool, and then we um, extend um, you know, funding to project sponsors and, and the like. Um, this fund um, can invest across the African continent, but our focus in the immediate term is on Nigeria, you know, given um, the, the, the gaps that we have. Um, we can invest in both um, Naira and dollar-denominated um, transactions. Um, also, it will be issued in tranches, like you mentioned, and um, we are starting out with the first um, 20 billion Naira um, tranche. Okay, and um, each tranche is going to have its own um, unique um, characteristics. So the first tranche, 20 billion, is going to be a debt um, fund, and it will have a term of um, 10 years with a possible extension of um, another two years. Um, so basically, we'll be focusing on um, on Nigeria, and um, um, so that those are the basic um, characteristics of this fund. Okay, so uh, you said that the areas that you'll be focusing on would be energy, infrastructure, telecommunications, tell us how investors can access this investment opportunity and platform. Yes, okay, um, so like I mentioned earlier, um, it's going to be a pool structure. Okay, so um, we are currently in the market doing, um, you know, the fundraising for the first tranche of 20 billion naira now. Okay, so once investors qualify, right, in terms of the, 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 the regulatory requirements, being institutional investors or in the HNI category, so all you need to do is just, um, you know, fill out the form and, um, you know, you come on board. Um, and also, like you mentioned, we'll be looking at a broad range of, um, of sectors, power, transport, ICT, water treatment, and the like. Those are key sectors that impact the daily lives of um, Nigerians. All right, so you're targeting a 20 billion naira fund for the first tranche. Will it have a term of up to 12 years? And uh, how many tranches are planned and at what intervals? 
Okay, um, so I think that's a very important question. Uh, and um, so we are looking at around uh, five to seven tranches, right, in this um, first um, program that we are coming out with, but it's not going to stop there, right? And um, our approach really is to say that we'll go, go out there, we will, um, you know, turn on our origination um, machinery because a lot of work has to go into the origination of those transactions, preparing those transactions with the project um, promoters and sponsors. A lot of work goes in the investment appraisal. And when we are comfortable and confident enough that the products have been structured or the investments have been structured and um, you know they are suitable to be brought to um, the attention of investors, then we'll go out there to tap the market to, to you know, prospect for, for funds for those um, uh, transactions that fall within that, um, that, that particular bucket. And at every point in time, you will have transactions at different stages of um, you know, completion. So for a, for a transaction, for example, you could be at the very early stage where you are still um, you know, engaging project um, parties, structuring them together, putting them together, having them at the table, discussing how to, um, to, to structure the underlying investments, the sort of risk um, management, um, uh, uh, mitigation, risk and mitigation um, you know, um, solutions that you need to use to wrap up each and every one of these transactions. So after doing all the work, then you then tend to go on to the approval stage and then, um, you know, you then come to market. So what benefits does uh, Stambic IBTC Infrastructure Fund have when you compare it to other options in the market? Yes, yeah, so um, a couple of things right there. Um, the first is the fact that um, our investors have reposed a lot of um, you know, trust in us. So we don't take that for granted. And... Um, that's why we have a very, very robust um, internal governance framework, okay, which starts at the fund management level. So you have the fund management team doing the origination, the structuring, and the like. Then it goes on to a committee, an investment committee, which looks at what the fund management team has done, just to ensure that it complies with um, you know, the fund's um, core mandate. Um, having said that, um, the next thing will then be to, 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 to have these transactions um, you know, approved. So that framework is very, very important, you know, for investors, in, especially in terms of, you know, driving confidence. Um, the next thing is we also have a very robust, um, you know, technical, internal, um, you know, expertise in this regard, right? Um, when you look at the structure of our organization, Stambic IBTC Asset Management, a subsidiary of Stambic IBTC Holdings, which is a member of Standard Bank Group. So we have a lot of sector specialists that are available to us at no cost to um, investors in this, uh, in this fund. Unlike other products that you probably have, they don't have many of those, um, you know, sector specialists. Many of them have experience in the selected um, um, sectors that we that, that, that we have. They have robust experience of more than 20 years, some 30 years. But other funds will probably have to go out there to hire and then pass on a lot of cost onto the fund. The next thing is the diversification. So considering the fact that we have a lot of, you know, internal resources to appraise these transactions, we're able to pick and choose the best of those transactions and present them to investors as opposed to just being restricted restricted to maybe uh, just power sector or transport sector. We're able to invest across a broad range of um, sectors. Also, there's a predefined exit, you know, like, like um, you know, we mentioned earlier, it's a 10-year term that can be extended by another two years. So there's that line of sight for investors that after a specific period, they can exit. And we're also looking at um, listing the fund as well at the appropriate um, time so that there is some form of um, potential liquidity for investors to, to come out of the fund. All right. So return on investment continues to drive, you know, investment decisions, you know, considering that inflation rate is significantly high right now. Uh, what type of returns do you expect would uh, motivate investors, you know, to consider this fund? Okay. So when we started out on this journey, right, the first thing we did was to engage um, the target investors. You know, we had a series of, of meetings, discussions, and the idea is to ensure that we don't come out with a product that we that we, we sat down on our own to create, okay? Um, so we engaged investors thoroughly. We discussed all the issues around inflation, and unfortunately, we don't have um, a lot of um, inflation uh, um, uh, benchmarked transactions in Nigeria. So what we've done is to go for the next uh, best uh, option in collaboration with those um, investors. And the next best option that we've come up with is the federal government bond um, with a similar tenor, right, to the target tenor of the fund. So the 10-year bond, currently it's yielding around um, between 12 to 
And what we are saying is that um, you know we look for transactions that have the potential to deliver a premium above that um, that um, target return. So we are looking at a premium of two percent to five percent above what the federal government bond is yielding. And if you, if if you look at the upper end of that range, it takes you closer to inflation rate. So we think that's something that is um, very important for investors, and um, it has created a lot of um, interest in the fund as well. All right. So can you uh, describe some of the milestones the company has accomplished? And what you envisaged the growth prospects for the newly introduced fund, this infrastructure fund we're talking about? Okay, um, in terms of milestones, I think the most important one is the fact that we have about 16 collective investment schemes in uh, you know, under management of standard IBTC asset management. Okay, that is by far the highest that uh, any SEC registered fund manager is managing directly. Okay, we think that's, um, that's quite um, significant. And out of those uh, 16 funds, I can tell you that we have at least three of them, right, with assets under management in excess of 100 billion. Again, that speaks to the trust that um, our investors have in, you know, what we are doing, you know, and we, we, we really appreciate that, um, that support. Now, having said that, we don't just stop there. We look for opportunities to increase the product offerings because you have a lot of investors out there with diverse needs. And what we are doing is we continually engage and um, continue to structure uh, new investment propositions. So in the next um, you know, few months, I can tell you that we'll come out with maybe another two or three, um, three investment uh, solutions. So that's very important for us. Also, at, at, as um, Stanley Kibitz Asset Management, we, we have um, you know, double A ratings from two of the top um, rating agencies in Nigeria. That's um, GCR and um, Augusto & Co. Um, we also think that's, um, that's um, very, very um, significant. Um, by and large, um, you know, and just to just just to um, bring on the point, um, we, we 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 think that um, you know this um, infrastructure fund is going to is going to grow, and the reason is because it's a product that we have structured in collaboration with um, the target investors. So it's not based on our own feeling or our thinking; it's based on what the market is asking for. And when you have a client focused um, approach to business, we think um, that will drive um, you know the growth that you will see. Thank you. All right, so with your subsidiaries offering a broad range of financial solutions, how well has uh, Stambic IBTC Asset Management you know, supported clients through the other uh, solutions offered by the group? Okay, um, I, I would like us to take that uh, you know, a step further. Don't let us talk about Stambic IBTC Asset Management alone, right? Just think about a Stambic um, you know, person. So when you sit in front of a Stambic person, okay, what the person is thinking about is not um, you know, the products to offer to you, but what you need, right, as an investor or as an individual. And by the time you get into those conversations, you'll, do, you'll, you'll find out that um, for asset management, for example, beyond the 16 funds that we, that we manage, you could find that what the person talking to you about investment really needs is maybe um, how to put his or her house in order. The person probably even has, um, you know, more knowledge than, 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 than you do regarding investment. So you're able to help them connect the dots extend um, you know other products to them and you know just give them a, a, a very robust and detailed um, uh, um, uh, you know client experience so to speak so for example it would mean that the, the client needs pension solutions it would mean that the person needs to put his house in order in terms of you know trusted services and um, stock broking and the like so we have a broad range of um, offerings you know just think of think about us as a, you know, a financial supermarket that is able to deliver um, you know a broad range of financial solutions. All right, financial supermarket. Just before we let you go, what's your assessment of the investment environment in the country? Just briefly, because we're out of time. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I think it's still quite challenging when you look at all the um, available statistics. Inflation rate is high. Um, unemployment is, is also there and, and the like. So we think it's very difficult uh, you know, for any business to operate right now. But having said that, um, what we're trying to do is really to support um, you know, the investment um, community. So if we deal with the power supply issues, if we deal with the transport issues, then, you know, businesses will become a lot more uh, productive. Even people, individuals, will, will tend to have, um, you know, better lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Larry Mohammed, the Senior Vice President at Stambi Capital Infrastructure Fund. And we do wish you all the best, and your investors too, as they invest in the Infrastructure Fund. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. So the Naira gained at the end of trading last week. Willie Bong gives us the details. Hello, Will. 
Good morning, Ini. Good morning. Uh, yes, like you said, the Naira is gaining. I think we are beginning to see the impact of the changes made by the CBN regarding the, uh, the restrictions on the FX to BDCs and the supply to banks. Well, we'll head and see what's happening there. We see that the sports forwards and futures in the week ended. August 6 had a total turnover of $667.44 million. Uh, a ton, that's a total turnover we held. It was, but it was, however, it was down by 24.93% from $902.45 million reported in the previous weeks. And this was jointly driven by the, the losses decline in the FX port and forward and the derivatives, uh, excuse me, of 17.02% uh, and 39.89% each. And um, the investors and exporters window, we also see that there was, because which is a representative, which is representative of the FX port, that decline of 17.02%. Uh, we had a total uh, turnover of, of 489.85 million naira. However, at the market, uh, NAFEX window, the rate gained marginally, the right naira rose against the dollar by 0.01%. We saw a two cover appreciation in value to 411. 11 naira, 16 cobalt to a dollar. Now, to give us more perspective on what's happening there, we'll talk to uh, Akwewe Oputu, a fixed income dealer at Access Bank. Good morning, Akwewe. Good morning. Thank you for having me on the show. It's good to have you too. Uh, Akwewe, we have seen um, appreciation in the naira especially in the BDC market. We see a 0.23% uptick there. Uh, What's driving this? Uh, we, we know that there's still a spread in the, between the official market and the parallel market of about 20%. Will this drive arbitrage bets and speculations and narrow? Will it continue to drive that? Okay, so um, like you mentioned, there's a huge spread between um, what the, the Naira, Naira is trading in the parallel market and what it is at the official window. So we see the parallel market trading around 508 Naira to the dollar right now, while the official window is trading around 411.25. So it's actually been, there's actually been an appreciation in that window coming from the 520 naira we were seeing where the parallel market went to when the announcement was made that um, the central bank would stop sending funds to the BDCs. So if the central bank continues to intervene for the uh, the in the market for the FPIs and for the invisible transaction, we continue to see the, a decline in the margin because um, we, customers will feel comfortable going to banks because they will be able to um, get these funds at a reduced rate compared to where it's trading in the parallel market. So the only customers that we might find um, buying or sourcing funds in the parallel market are those who cannot um, access the uh, official market due to the nature of their transactions. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, input. Well, before you go, could you tell us your outlook for the fixed income market as investors are also looking forward to the first uh, NTB PME, that's the auction? For August, what do you think about? That? Okay, there's an NTB auction of about 51 billion coming up on Wednesday. We expect an oversubscription at the market. We expect a decline, a further decline in the yields, especially on the 364 days as we, as we have seen so far in the last three auctions. There's a lot of demand out there, a lot of um, investors looking for where to put their funds. And the, and the secondary market, these bills are already trading sub 8% levels, where it clo and it closed at 8.2 at the last NTB auction. So we expect to see this demand filter into the auction and thereby dropping the rate further at the NTB auction. Thank you so much, Akwaya. That's Akwaya Oputu, a fixed income dealer at Access Bank. Now let's check out the stock market, which rose by 0.68% despite pockets of profit-taking activities in bellwether stocks. The market recorded gains in four out of the five trading sessions. The all-share index at, well, closed at 38,810.75 points, while the equity cap was at 20.22 uh, trillion naira. Uh, Etel Africa drove the market, the weekly gain, and we saw that also with M TN, the week was really, the activities was filled with those telcos. The volume, the month to date, 
increased to about 0. Point, the month they gain, we saw an appreciation of 0.7%. However, activity levels were down as volumes declined by 30.1%, 32.0% each, volume and value respectively. Deals was at 19,617. Oh, the sectoral performance was broadly negative. Following declines in the key sector indexes, we saw that even the, the, the banking sector, the tier one banks, lost about 31 billion naira during uh, last week. Um, we move over to the NASD, um, the over-the-counter market, where we have a 0 0.04 appreciation, where the uh, index uh, stood at 752.81 points. The market cap uh, was at 654.32 billion naira. Investors uh, also gained 0 0.27 billion naira. Total volume of uh, securities traded for the week was at 30.84 million, while the value was to 1.04 billion naira, and all traded in one. 102 transactions. We have David Adori, a stockbroker at High Cap Securities, to give us uh, his, a broader perspective on what's happening in the equities market. Good morning, David. Thank you. Good morning. Happy to be with you. Great. Uh, happy to have you, too. Um, for most of last week, the sectoral indexes were in the red, and all the key sectors closed the week negative. What drove this? Yeah, actually, the... Uh, Sectors uh, were all in the red, but um, I think what propelled the equities market was um, the volume and value of uh, exchange traded products that uh, increased uh, tremendously. So I believe that that was uh, the reason why the all share index is uh, appreciated uh, marginally by about 0.68%. Uh, so last week was. Uh, not so bad after all because uh, those uh, declines in volume and value did not uh, have material impact on the movement of the market. Because the market is still rising on the impressive uh, half year results of several listed companies and also the declaration of the uh, interim leaders. Uh, again, the equities market is not so bullish because. Uh, of uh, what is happening in the bond uh, side of the market. Last week, uh, bonds uh, appreciated by about 0.45%. Indicating, therefore, that financial assets uh, moved more into the bond uh, sector than in the equity. So the market is actually like a candle that is burning uh, at both ends, which uh, is uh, very interesting to investors because all categories of investors based on their investment objectives, those who want uh, safety, and for those who want uh, appreciation of capital, they have uh, uh, areas in the market they can key into. So the market is actually uh, moving in the right direction at both ends. Thank you so much, David, for that um, insight. David Adonri is a stockbroker at High Cap Securities Limited. So there we have it. David has said the candle is burning at both sides. Investors are still finding ways, places to invest their monies in and hopefully to get good returns. That's what we have for you today. Thank you so much, Will. And uh, we do hope that the week will bring uh, better news before we get to the end of it. Well, we'll take a break now. When we come back from that break, we'll do an opening call to London. Do stay with us. It's Business Morning on Channel Television. You're welcome back. You're still watching Business Morning on Channel Television. We'll move over to our London studios now where Juliana is standing by. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Thank God it's Monday. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> hmm. Good morning. <laughs> So we watched a video of him floating in space, and now Richard Branson may relinquish overall control of the business as Virgin Atlantic is considering raising funds under London Stock Exchange. Any peep into investor sentiments on this? 
Yes, good morning, Ine. This is uh, for Sir Richard Branson's airline uh, business, Virgin Atlantic, not to be uh, confused with Virgin Galactic, the space uh, tourism uh, business. But this is uh, potentially good news um, uh, for the firm. They've had a pretty torrid 18 months. Unlike uh, their competitors, uh, British Airways and EasyJet, they were unsuccessful in trying to get the government to bail them out of trouble. But they did manage to raise about one 1.5 billion uh, pounds, but the aviation industry um, has suffered, um, particularly long haul flights between uh, New York and London Heathrow, which have been particularly uh, lucrative for Virgin Atlantic. In fact, um, according to the last earnings posted in 2019, it accounted uh, for 40 percent of the revenue. According to investors, there is going to be a rapid turnaround of long haul um, flights by the end of the year, and Virgin Atlantic. Uh, want to get their hands on a bit of that money, which is why uh, they're mulling over a London IPO. Um, this is the first for them. Again, this will bring them in line with their competitors, particularly IAG, the um, British Airways parent opener, um, owner, and Cafe uh, Pacific. Um, according to reports, um, investment bankers from Barclays and City have been hired to oversee the IPO, and if it's successful, should be done about um, uh, eight weeks time. Okay, and uh, Philip Morris has increased the stakes in the takeover battle for Vectora. Can you fill us in on what's going on behind the scenes of this? Yeah, well, private equity firms have been raiding uh, British-listed uh, businesses for the past couple of months. And now Vectora, which is a British-based inhaling company, they offer uh, medicines in asthma and other non-smoking and smoking-related uh, um, illnesses. Um, they've had two um, takeover bids. One is from Philip Morris International, which is the owner of Marlboro Cigarettes, as well as um, other associated brands, and also Carlisle Group. Now, I believe Philip Morris International got in there first. Uh, Carlisle upped the offer on Friday morning, which was accepted uh, by bosses at Vectora for, I believe, it was just short of about a billion uh, pounds. Over the weekend, Philip Morris have upped their bid to about 1.4 billion pounds. Just shows how uh, desperate they are to get their hands on that business. And at the moment, there are no signs on whether Victoria are, Vectora are going to um, uh, offer or or accept the bid uh, from Philip Morris International. This obviously comes at a time where smoking companies across the world are under increasing pressure. They've had a series of bad uh, news, especially during the pandemic, which we know uh, most sufferers were really infected uh, with uh, lung issues. Now, Philip Morris International, as well as other big firms um, in the sector, have said within the next five to ten years, they want to shift away uh, from tobacco um, to vaping and other uh, businesses like the ones that Victoria have to offer. So we just have to wait and see. But at the moment, the US private equity firm Carlisle do seem to be winning the bid. But of course, now more money has been put on the table. It's open up uh, to investor choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's Monday. What data are we looking out for this week? Uh, well, all eyes and ears are going to be on Thursday, where we get uh, GDP figures for the month of June, the last month of Q2. Um, you know, all, all um, uh, 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 um, firms and bodies, including the Bank of England and the IMF, do seem to think Britain is going to have a rapid recovery uh, from the pandemic, with growth of about 7 to 7.25% uh, this year. But the PMI figures that we've been discussing on this show over the past couple of weeks haven't been strong. In fact, even uh, some of uh, the data we've had uh, from credit and debit card companies does show that consumer confidence is starting to decrease. However, we are expecting to see growth. Some put it to about 1.8 to 1.7 percent month on month. So we'll keep our eyes on that on Thursday. And then lots of corporate data. I believe Deliveroo are going to be updating as well as intercontinental hotels. We've also got a load of updates expected from insurers and bookies uh, firms. So yes, as always, Annie, you'll be keeping me busy this week yeah i sure we sure will and we'll start with 1 30 during business incorporated so we'll talk to you then thank you so we'll move over to the crypto space now it's a red monday very unlike or like a friday yeah we're, we're, what we're did used you do to, to this monday <laughs> we're used to the red friday but uh we had a green friday so uh maybe some profit taking and we have this uh red monday it was a good weekend bitcoin is in red 
uh, Ethereum, after hitting a high of over $3,000, uh, it got uh, below the $3,000 uh, mark this morning. And a couple of uh, major altcoins also in the red. Uh, we have the stable coins in the green, showing that uh, traders are running into stable coins. Uh, market cap, $1.76 trillion. It's down about 4.72% this morning. Uh, 24 hour volume, $98.39 billion uh, traded in the total crypto market. It's down about uh, 20%. Let's uh, bring in Olumde Additional now to bring us up speed. Hello, Olumde. Yeah, hello, Laji. Good morning. Good morning, Olumde. Great to have you. So uh, we've had the, you know, uh, Ethereum London hard fork, uh, but traders are still complaining about high Ethereum uh, fees. What What's going on there? Yeah, um, I think... Um a lot of users uh, do understand that the upgrade was more about um, solving the supply and um, supply uh, metrics. You know, the term has a lim unlimited uh, amount that can um, produced, and also you need to consider the fact that um, the gas fees, like you said, were on the high side. But the lot of this focused more on the accuracy of gas fees. So the fact that um, we saw Ethereum being bought at record levels didn't mean that um, um, uh, at the other end it was being it wasn't being produced. So definitely on the economic ma ma uh, definition, it meant that it was solving inf inflationary concerns rather than um, eating on the deflation uh, motives. So uh, we didn't see much changes in that. And you need to understand that um, the usage of Ethereum is still at record high. Uh, NFTs, many NFTs are still running on this um, uh, this chain. So you get it that we still have a banner smart uh, chain and other uh, chain um, blockchains, but um, Ethereum still um, takes the lion's share. So I think uh, maybe future upgrades might address that, but right now I think it's more about supply issues. Okay. Well, let's uh, look at price action now. It was, it was a green uh, weekend right from uh, Friday with Ethereum hitting over $3,000. Uh, Bitcoin uh, hit about $45,000. Uh, but we have a pullback this morning. What's your outlook for the week? Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, you need to see that, um, just like you rightly said, um, if you look at price patterns, it tells you that Bitcoin buyers are facing resistance around its 100 day uh, small moving average and you need to understand the small moving average is um, sorry the simple moving average is around the 40, uh, four thousand eight hundred dollar mark and the reason is not far fetched you need to understand that um, we are all crypto pundits and experts and stakeholders are really waiting for the uh, bill to pass uh, u.s congress um, uh, uh, is trying to raise um 20 billion from the crypto industry and that's the infrastructure bill. So uh, one of the problems is that uh, the, the the bill has a loose definition of broker. You know, you definitely when you when you listen to what brokers are, they are in familiarity between the buyer and uh, the seller. But right. um, you know, um, the bill says that um, miners um, and other software developers and other key players in industry are are going to have to report in transactions. So that's where the problem is. But I think the good thing about the bill is that it can be amended because the vote is going to take on Tuesday. So we are seeing um, a kind of pullback from investors. Also, you need to understand that, uh, as I speak to you, the dollar is at four months high. And the fact that you need to understand that um, not just Bitcoin is um, looking to suffer more downside, could oil prices lost over 350 basis points just this morning. And the same thing will go down by a percent. So okay. market expectations are that Bitcoin might follow the trend. Just right. like uh, I think uh, for now, Bitcoin seems to be standing firm, but uh, Ladi, I, I don't think uh, that would be for too long <laughs> because the dollar right. is, seems to be flying out of the Okay, air. We'll, we'll see if the bulls can uh, hold on. All right, Lumile, thank you so much. Thank you, Ladi. All right, top auto market cap here, BNB, that down 5%. Uh, biggest loser on the uh, top auto market cap is uh, Dogecoin, the king of meme coins, down about 12.35% uh, this morning. So, in it, it's, a red, uh, it's a red Monday. We'll see how the week uh, goes. It will be a red Tuesday. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. <laughs> the traders don't want to hear that. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for watching the program today. Uh, that's where we say thank you for joining us. It's been a good one hour, but uh, remember we have another bumper 30 minutes at 1.30 during business and corporate. So do join us then. But for now, I'm Imi John Mekwa. And I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for watching.